because if you write for a daily newspaper, you're not exactly writing realistically. You know how athletes talk. They're as they as they should be. They're very profane, like we are when we're together. They they use all kind of curse words. Not me, Lord. Not you. Well, I could never put that in the, when I wrote for the Chronicle or the PD. So I was able to use a more realistic vocabulary. And what I wanted to do was to write about really famous people. There were 64 chapters and almost everyone is me interacting in a scene with a, a very famous person like Michael Jordan or, or, or Steve Young. I mean, anyone you could, could imagine. And uh, I call it not really journalism, but it would be sort of what you'd call creative nonfiction. For 25 years, I taught creative nonfiction to graduate writing students at University of San Francisco. And I put into practice everything I had learned. And every morning I would wake up, I'd get a cup of coffee. Uh, I, my office where I am now is downstairs. I would run down the stairs, Mark, to write. That's how excited I would be. <laughs> that's inspiring in itself because I'm I'm headed toward uh, that uh, I know and you're going to do <laughs> that word retirement. You know, I, I wanted to ask you though because I think you have a unique background, and I thought your perspective on sports was obviously different from the first time I read you before I knew you. Talk a little bit about uh, the genesis of your sports writing career because uh, you didn't go through the normal channels. I, I don't see Lowell Cohn as out uh, covering high school football games on a, on a Friday night and working your way up the chain. Talk a little bit about your background at Stanford and, and how that uh, basically morphed into uh, this unique sports writing career that you had for so many years. Yeah, you know, in fact, I, I, I never did study journalism, and I got a job as a sports columnist at the San Francisco Chronicle in 1979, just because an editor there thought I was a good writer. And for a long time, uh, other sports writers were, were really angry at me. They felt I had jumped the line. I heard a lot, you didn't pay your dues, that kind of thing which I suppose I would have felt that way as well if some other schmuck uh, got in front of me. My background was I was an English major at Lafayette College in Pennsylvania. I got into Stanford Graduate School in English in 1966 and did a master's and a PhD in English literature at Stanford. My field was the history of the English novel and I wrote on Joseph Conrad. When I finished in 1972, I did not want to be an academic. Uh, I wanted a life with action but I didn't know how to do it. So I started um, freelancing articles for Sports Illustrated when it was really, really a hell of a magazine. It was a, a, every, it was a literary masterpiece and they liked my stuff. Uh, they published a bunch of my things. I sent them into the Chronicle. The Chronicle said, we'll take you and that was it. So I never learned, studied journalism. As a result, I didn't, I didn't look at it the way the way other journalists do, and they look at it a good way. I'm not putting them down, but for me, the people I met, let's say Don Nelson, when he was the coach of the Warriors, I didn't just want to copy down his quotes. For me, I was studying him the way I would study a character in Dickens or Dostoevsky. Who is he? How does he move? How does his body language reveal his inner state? What is valuable to him? What does he really want in life? Is he a decent guy? Um, what's his theme? And I would ask myself all of these questions about Joe Montana or Bill Walsh. Bill Walsh I wrote a book about. And so for me, I approach them the way I would approach Hamlet with that level of seriousness and thinking they had that depth. Well, Lowell, you know, as we explore some of the personalities uh, that you encountered in your 40 some years. Uh, talk a little bit about how players and coaches for that matter reacted to your, I'm gonna call it a different style of, of sports writing because as you say, you were kind of coming at them in a different way. Did you meet with immediate acceptance or was <laughs> it more like, where is this guy coming from? Because to me, uh, some of the most intriguing uh, chapters in your book were just 
seeing how characters like, uh, you know, Will Clark, Joe Montana, Jerry Rice, uh, you know, Barry Bonds, and, and then Bill Walsh, more of an intellectual, would react to you and how your relationships uh, developed uh, over the years. Talk a little bit about what your first reception was from some of these guys. They didn't know where I was coming from. I, they thought I was a Martian. I remember when I first started, the Giants had a lot of very religious players. And they, they used to call them, I didn't, but they used to call them the God Squad. Gary Lavelle was one, Johnny LeMaster. And they were really doing badly. So. I, I thought about the play and the movie, Damn Yankees, and I, you know, where they got involved uh, with the devil and, and it helped. So I said, what the Giants should do would be to sacrifice one of their players sold to the devil, and maybe they could get a winning record. But Mark, it was just a joke. Johnny yeah. Lamar, he was so sweet. Such a, one of my all-time favorite, the shortstop. Very nice guy. He came up to me, he was really religious, and he said, Oh, Lowell, what did you do? You said we should go to the devil. And I said, no, uh, Johnny, that was just satire. <laughs> he said, what satire? He didn't know. And I, they, he thought I meant it literally. And I had to uh, apologize and explain and tell him what satire was. And I, I ran into that a lot. But there was one other thing. Uh, part of my personality, of course, is that Stanford stuff. But I am from Brooklyn, New York. And in Brooklyn, New York, you really learn how to not only deal with conflict, you sort of learn to love it. So what would happen was I would write things and I would think 40, some 49ers or Oakland A's or Giants would get really angry and get in my face. And because when you do that with sports writers, a lot of them get afraid. My right. attitude was, please do it because I'm going to beat you right now. And after a while, they laid off because I was so not intimidated, but I would never run away. So there's a begrudging respect that, let's say, Will Clark, you know, could be very difficult. Will Clark's a wonderful guy. He's, Mark, he's turned into a wonderful guy. But when he was younger, he really could be tough. And I would never take it from him. And after a while, there was a twinkle in his eye and we had a lot of fun. When Frank Robinson, who was a really tough guy was managing the Giants. Um, if I was in his office and it was boring, and they'd be, you know, before the game, you used to be able to go into the manager's office, you can't anymore. And yeah. if it was boring, he'd say, ask me a tough one. Come on, Lowell, ask me a tough one. He wanted it. Yeah. Yeah, and well, you know, that's the thing. And, and I kind of learned from you in a way that if, if you allow them to bully you, because they know that you need something from them. And they kind of hold that over your head sometimes in covering these sports teams. But you always acted like, eh, if, if you don't want to give me what I want, I'll just move on to the next guy. You can say whatever you want to me. And you never allowed them to intimidate you. Do you think that was part of your uh, of Brooklyn upbringing, taught you to be thick-skinned to an extent and be able to refuse to allow them to get inside your head. It seems like more the converse than, you know, you were inside their heads. Well, I could say when there was conflict, I enjoyed it. It's nothing that in intimidated me. I actually enjoyed it. And um, I, one time when Kevin Mitchell came to the Giants, and again, Kevin Mitchell's a good guy, but Kevin Mitchell's a tough guy. So he didn't like something I wrote. And it was before a game, uh, I was standing at home plate during batting practice behind the cage. And Kevin came over and he said, I didn't like what you write. You better w what you wrote. You better watch out. And I said to Kevin, who do you think you're talking to? I said, you're not scaring me. Don't ever talk to me like that again. My mother was a school teacher. She used to say things like that. You watch your behavior. Don't ever talk to me like that again. And he got a look in his eye. We were okay. We, he loved me. Kevin and I yeah. were okay. Yeah, I want to ask you about some of the personalities that uh, you found most provocative throughout your uh, career. You've mentioned a, a couple of the players, and and I can attest, I can attest to the toughness of a Frank Robinson or the uh, difficulty that a young Will Clark would uh, provide. And, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, Barry Bonds. But one of the most fascinating characters that I 
uh, liked reading about in your book, and, and I've had experience with them as well. But I think you found him so provocative and interesting because of his intellect and uh, basically the architect and so ahead of his time, uh, Bill Walsh, I'm talking about the coach of the 49ers, legendary. But you had a very interesting relationship with him because you were close and then you had a little bit of a falling out and then you came together and a lot of people don't know this, but you were actually uh, one of the last uh, people that spoke to him uh, before he passed away. And, and I have always found him one of the most interesting sports characters because he, so much of him had to do with anything other than football in, in a sense. Lowell, take it from there on Bill well, Walton. I would, I would say in my lifetime, the two most important sports figures in the Bay Area are Willie Mays and Bill Walsh. I mean, Joe Montana, Steve Young, but Willie Mays and, and Bill Walsh. Bill Walsh, um, in terms of football, changed offense. He just changed the way all offense, all offense was played in the National Football League. And as a result, he changed defense too, because they had to keep up with him. He was miles ahead of everyone else. He was a curious, very brilliant man. But Mark, he was also incredibly insecure. And I don't think even his players knew it because he knew, I'm going to say, he knew how to put on a persona, to put on an act, and he would have the coach persona. And he was great. He was the greatest coach I've ever been around. Um, but he needed constant building up. It's like he woke up every day with an emotional deficit and he needed people to tell him, you know, Bill, you're really brilliant. You're really a good guy. Um, you're going to win. Things like that. He had had a very abusive dad who I think may have, may have hit him. Bill had a lot of trouble talking about his father. And I think part of the deficit was that. So that what would happen with Bill, um, especially after he retired, I would get a lot of phone calls from him. And I mean, he would say things like, hi, Lowell, it's Bill. Hi, Bill. And he'd say, you know, I got my feelings hurt. This is Bill Walsh. I, you, and I'd say, who? He said, John York, who was then the, pro well, he is the owner of the Niners, but now he's let the kid take over. But John York hurt my feelings and this is what he did. And, and I'd have to say, oh, don't take him seriously, Bill. You don't work for him anymore. It's, yeah, you're right. Yeah, things like that. And he was a very, a, a kind of a very insecure guy. Um, I wrote a book about him and he didn't like it. He really didn't like it. He felt that uh, I portrayed him in a negative way. I don't think I did. I think I portrayed him in a really positive way. But what I came to realize, unless I made him Jesus Christ, nothing would be good enough for him. Uh, he could have no flaws. He could never use the F word, although he uses it, he used it every other sentence. So I got angry and I didn't talk to him for two years, but he made it up. He was really good about it. He, he wanted to be friends and he made it up. And about six weeks before he died, he had leukemia. He asked me and my colleague from the, former colleague from the Chronicle, Ira Miller, who had covered those great teams to come to his house in Woodside and see him and have lunch with him. And just before that, Jack Cakebread, that's Cakebread Cellars in Napa, along Highway 29, um, sent me a case of wine for Bill. He was intimidated to send it to Bill himself because Bill was such a big name. So I brought this wonderful cake bread Chardonnays over and we, uh, Ira and I sat in the backyard with Bill and it was extremely touching because he, he was dying. And then on the way out, he said, I had brought some sandwich, which would we clean up and put the stuff in the trash because his wife liked a neat home. And as Ryra and I were leaving, he said, goodbye, men, which is how we would call his players sometimes, men. And I said to Ira when we got in the car, we're never going to see Bill again. And Ira said, why? And I said, he pulled back. He, he became formal. Not Lowell and Ira. I mean, he knew us a long time. Goodbye, men. It was a way of, of ending it. Well, this is an unfair question. Um, you know, and, and we'll go back because... Bill Walsh, such a fascinating character. I'm interested in some of your other observations with him. But I want to I touch on um, a, a guy that um, 
I think is almost like a lightning rod. Uh, other media people that I've known through the years. Uh, and let's get a raise of hands by some of our um, uh, other Zoomies tonight. Uh, Giants fans in the in the crowd, raise your hand a little bit if you if you follow the Giants. So so you're you're familiar with um, Barry Bonds, one of the most controversial figures. And whenever anybody asks me who is the most difficult player or athlete that you've ever dealt with, it's kind of like this: Barry Bonds who, by the way, celebrated his 56th birthday today. Can you believe that? Hard to believe he's 56. But Barry Bonds and anybody else down here, what was your relationship like with Barry Bonds? And, and in the end, uh, how did you psychoanalyze him? Okay. I had a very difficult relationship with him. I don't know anybody who had a good relationship with him. He um, was so rude and so condescending. Now I understand there's conflict between media and athletes, but this was way, way beyond that. Um, now look, he was a great ball player. He may have been the greatest ball player ever. Um, but I mean, aside from what everybody thinks he did and why he can't get into the, into the hall of fame, um, I had a perfectly miserable uh, relationship with him. Um, did you have a good relationship with him? Well, you knew him better than I did. He did you a favor. Do you want to tell them that story? <laughs> Give me a, a guy little lost reminder. The, tape. the guy lost oh. the tape? Oh, yeah. It's well, this, this is story. pretty funny. Barry Bonds, uh, to say he was moody <laughs> is an understatement. But, and Lowell's had this experience too, you could catch Barry in a particular mood where not only would he do an interview with you, but he would give you a dose of just the best stuff. You almost couldn't get him to quiet down. Seriously, just stop. So one time we were down in spring training and Barry, I just lucked out. We were doing an hour special on the Giants before the season was to start, sat down. And to say that he was effusive is a, an understatement gave us great insights as the team, his career, what made him tick. And we got so much stuff. We even turned off the camera and he kept talking. He was telling me about troubles in his marriage and, mm. and stuff with his kids, like almost like, okay, Barry, that's, that's enough. That's good. So we had all this stuff on tape. And it was, it was gold when you get an interview like that with the star player in all of baseball. So we, back in those days, you had all your stuff on a cassette tape. Long story short, our photographer was so careful with the tape that he decided he was not going to put it in his luggage, that he was going to carry it with him, um, you know, on the plane. He actually wound up leaving the cassette on the bumper of the rental car at the airport. We lost that tape. We got all the way back to Oakland. We're like, you know, Steve, where's, where's the tape? You know, and, um, and he, he didn't have it. He's like, oh, I, I think I left it on the, on the car bumper at the airport. So we literally had to tell our boss what happened at Channel 2, turn around the next day and fly back uh, to Arizona, and I had to grovel and ask Barry for another interview. And trust me, just getting him once is is a chore. He just, you know, I explained to him, Barry, you know, blah, 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 the cameraman, he feels so bad. And can we get that interview? And he just looked at me, stared at me, and he says, it's not my fault <laughs> that you guys hire effing morons to to uh you know as cameramen and uh i cleaned that up for you see proud of me on that so <laughs> so uh i go well yeah i know barry you know and he goes no no not gonna do it no you got it you got it once and we need this you can't do an hour special on the giants you know in the early 90s without including i mean the late 90s without including barry bonds so literally i had to stay in arizona two days longer, every day I'd approach him, every day he'd say, no, no, no. He finally did the interview and 
he did the interview. I'm not kidding you. Three and four word answers to every question. <laughs> like it was the worst interview. Like Barry, how do you think the Giants are going to do? Oh, pretty good. They'll be okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think I'll do okay. And it was it was one of the most disastrous moments of my life. But it just gives you an example of how not only did he not have empathy or understand what our jobs were all about, but it's almost like he kind of took a strange pleasure in, you know, rubbing it in, make us wait. And then he decided to do the interview, which on its surface seems like a good thing. He finally relented and did it, but he made sure that uh, we weren't getting anything close to uh, approaching what, what we had in the can before. But Lowell, would you say that's pretty consistent with some of your experiences? And that's just one of many. I could give you some of the most unbelievable, very Bond stories. Well, I have uh, one one I can say quickly in the book. Again, it was the spring training. I think it was this last year. And for people who don't know how spring training works, in the regular season, when there is a season, you go to the clubhouse after the game. And then you can interview the players after a 10-minute cooling off period. But in spring training, a lot of the really famous players don't play the whole game. They could leave after the third or fourth or fifth inning and go play golf. They, they don't, you know, they don't play a lot. So uh, the PR staff said, Barry's going to be leaving after the fourth inning or something like that. And you, you're welcome to go in the clubhouse and talk to him because he's going to be leaving the ballpark. So a bunch of, I mean, it was Barry Bonds, right? So you have to go. And a bunch of us went down. Let's say there were eight to 10 of us. And we all went around his cubicle, his locker. He wasn't there. He was apparently taking a shower. So I hear the clip clop, and he's coming with his flip flops. And I turn around and he has a towel around him and he's going to go to his locker. He apparently felt that we didn't give him enough room to get through us to his locker. So we picked up a baseball bat like a cattle prod and he moved us out of the way uh, with a, with the baseball bat. And I, like, like we were pigs, you know what I mean? Or cattle. And I just thought that is so rude as opposed to excuse me, or you're in my way. I mean, he didn't say he just moved us. And then I thought, what if I moved him with a bat? What would happen then? He would have murdered me. Or I would have lost my credential, right? That would have been something to gone right to the league. So that was one of my Barry Bonds experiences. <laughs> hey, Lowell, can I, can I, uh, will you guys just let me tell you, that this is my favorite Barry Bonds story, though, that gives you some insight as to him. I mean, it, it's funny, but it's not funny. So those of you who have followed uh, baseball fairly closely, you, you might remember there was a very good left-handed pitcher named Al Leiter. He was an excellent pitcher in his day, Cy Young caliber pitcher. And so the Giants had his brother, whose name was Mark Leiter. Lowell, have I told you this story before? No, no. I, I remember Mark Leiter. Very nice man. <laughs> yeah. Nice guy, gentle spirit, but not even close. Like his big brother was a great pitcher. Mark Leiter barely, barely deserved to be in the major leagues. So the Giants had him, and one day uh, Al Leiter is pitching a beautiful shutout against the Giants in, in Miami, Florida. He was with the Marlins. And so Barry Bond strikes out, and J.T. Snow told me this story. Barry strikes out, and he walks, shows no emotion, walks back to the dugout, goes all just saunters down to the end of the dugout, and gets to Mark Leiter and he goes, Hey, are you any relation to that guy? And Mark Leiter lights up and he says, yeah, that's my big brother. And Barry looks at him and goes, we got the wrong effing brother and walks away. <laughs> and that sums up Barry <laughs> in a nutshell. I mean, I've got, I've got 20 of those on the tip of my tongue about just stuff that he's done that you just go, wow, who acts like that? <laughs> JT said everybody's jaw just dropped, you know, <laughs> you know in the dugout because there was silence. Like everybody was kind of like, 
what's he going down there to say to him? You know? <laughs> so, but anyway, that, that's Barry. And so would you say he's, he's your number one most difficult or have you had others? And if so, who, who pops into your mind, Mo? Okay, well, you said, said earlier there was Barry and everybody else was way below, but there was someone who was almost at the Barry level. And this is controversial and I apologize if it bothers people, but Colin Kaepernick was really difficult, Mark. Uh, he, um, why was he difficult? He got pleasure in embarrassing, humiliating media. Got, Mark, you've seen it, right? I'm not yeah, making this I, up. I've, I've experienced exactly what Lowell's talking about. And yeah. you know, now Colin Kaepernick's basically a deity and, and untouchable. But before all of this, um, Lowell and I experienced uh, a very, very different Colin Kaepernick. And, and Lowell, you, you go ahead and explain because my experiences are, you know, you and I have talked about it before. They're, they're very um, similar in what we both experienced with who I call the real Colin Kaepernick. Yeah. Now, again, we don't know what he's like now. I haven't talked to him in years. He may right. be a wonderful guy. This is when he was a young man. But, you know, he would have press conferences. Uh, as he's supposed to, he, he's the quarterback. And he would, it seemed to me, take pleasure in answering in fewer words than the questions. And in fact, the media used to keep track of the number of words he would use. And the questions did have more words than his answers. And he did it just to be, just to be nasty. And other times, when you, uh, on Wednesdays, the quarterback talks. Um, and when Alex Smith was a quarterback, in, in the, near the field, they had a big tent with a, with a stage and a microphone and chairs for the media. And it, it would be very civilized and you would do that. But Colin didn't want to do that. He would want to talk in the, in the locker room, which inconvenienced his, his teammates because there's a lot of media and it inconvenienced the media. So he would go to a place to stand, usually not by his locker, by someone else's locker, which wasn't nice. And everybody gets ready and, and the, the camera people, they're moving stuff on tripods and they're elbowing for position. It's very serious. And everybody would get set and he'd say, I don't want to talk here, not here. And then he'd move them around to another place in the locker room just to be nasty. So again, I am not discussing his message. He's done some very important and some very good things, especially what we see going on now. But you know, as a young man that I had to deal with, he was not Barry Bonds, but he wasn't very nice. Yeah. Well, I, I always um, hearken back to the, um, the press conference he did one time. It, he went through a stage where he just would give, because he's the quarterback, he has to, by rule, talk to the media. That's a rule, right? You know, he has to. Yeah. So he got it in his mind he was going to give us the least possible information so it got to where the 49ers media specialist would count how many words he would actually use in being able to complete a press conference and they would keep track of it and it was like a little game they play and um, my um, uh, a counterpart at Channel 2, Joe Fonzie, told me he was standing by this media guy and, um, and Colin came off the podium and said, and he goes, how many? And the oh, guy God. goes, 36, meaning 36. I just completed a press conference in 36 words. You know, so, um, you know, it kind of gives you an idea. And, and he was, you know, exulting in that, like, oh, it's close to my record, you know. And, uh, I, I have, Mark, I have a question in, the, uh, in another way. Who is your favorite sports figure that you ever covered? And it could be a manager, a coach, or a player. Uh, this is a good question. Um, well, I've got, you know, I kind of do it in the top five, but the guy that I've been thinking about uh, a lot lately, I mean, my, my top five uh, would have to be um, – you know, no particular order in the five, but Dusty Baker is is on top, Al Adels, and the guy that, that I'm really, um, you know, wanting to talk about is Dwight Clark, who, you know, left us, uh, you know, what is, that's what's been on my mind is, it's almost exactly two years now, isn't it, Lowell? Yeah. 
Yeah. Dwight and Clark, um, what, I'm, I'm going to use a very strange word to describe a robust athlete. He was a very sweet man. He had, yeah. such, he had, he was a very sweet man. He had, I mean, he made the most famous play in 49ers history. He was not a superstar, but he was a hell of a player. He never had that ego. He was no. always happy when he would see you, he'd see me. And he was almost more impressed with us than he thought we were with him, which of course was crazy. He was like <laughs> Clark. Um, he was always available. If you wanted to have a coffee or have lunch or talk on the phone, he was um, just a remarkably lovely person. And Mark, we've talked about not long before he died, we all went to Capitola. Remember that day? Right. Yes. He invited, he was so good with the media. He, I mean, he was dying and he wasn't going to live a long time. He was living near Capitola at the time. He invited maybe eight of us, would you say about yeah. eight? And yeah. we drove to Capitola. He treated us to lunch. He was in a wheelchair and um, we spent maybe two hours with him and then he got really tired. You could see that. But again, I mean, we, no one said, I'm not going to make the drive to Capitola <laughs> by Santa Cruz. Right? Nothing yeah. could stand in my way. We all went. And that's how yeah. much we liked and thought of him. Yeah. And the thing that always impressed me is I did uh, the 49ers postgame show with him uh, for a couple of years and many pregame shows and, and uh, have been through airports with Dwight Clark and people stopping him. And this is a guy who, you know, he looked like a movie star, you know, and, and he would always stop and people would tell them, here's where I was when you made that catch, you know, and the thing that struck me just standing aside and out of his way in the background was that he never, ever acted anything other than it was the first time he'd ever had someone right. tell him a story about where they were when he, when he made that catch. Gracious does not even describe it. And he would always sign his autograph, Dwight Clark in quotations, the catch, you know, and, and that's how he would go. A lot of athletes will just scribble something illegible. And, and he always accommodated people to the point of like, even almost making himself late. And I attribute that to, I don't think Dwight could actually believe that this life had happened to him. Like a lot of athletes are like, you know, cocky and you know and you know I had this coming I worked hard and yeah I'm a multi-millionaire and you know they give off that air even if they don't verbalize that but this guy stayed just um you know it's not humble is not even the right word he just stayed <laughs> as normal as anyone could get and uh, I was just so impressed with how he never gave off would you agree Lil, a vibe of yes. I'm some kind of big deal you know, he uh, was a 10th round draft pick. And yeah. um, I like the word you use normal because for me, the highest praise for a professional athlete for his personality is to call him normal because <laughs> a lot of them aren't no. <laughs> a lot of, I mean, they have egos like you just couldn't imagine. I would like to add another player. You say you have a top five. So let me do it as an interrogative. Do you put Steve Young in your top five? Uh, no, but he's certainly in my, uh, my uh, top 10. Um, but yeah, just a, a real um, thoughtful, I think, introspective guy. Yes. And uh, I think that, um, you know, he's definitely, definitely an athlete worth talking to. And I know, my, I have to say my favorite chapter in the book, Lowell, is, and I, I'd like you to amplify this a little bit, when you brought your son, who I love, uh, you know, Iggy is what I know him as, but Grant is his uh, formal name. But um, the story of when you brought, tell, tell the story about when you brought your son to meet Steve Young. Yeah, it's a classic. It's well, great. yeah, this is in, in the book. Um, Iggy, who's actually on the call now, he, uh, Grant Cohn covers the Niners for Sports Illustrated. Um, he was seven years old and he asked me, dad, could I meet Steve Young? And ordinarily, I never wanted to portray athletes as heroes or to involve them in my private life. But this is my kid. And he asked, so I asked Steve Young, could, could my son Grant, 
Iggy come down and meet you? And Steve said, absolutely. I mean, sure, he's so sweet. So we drove down, we made an appointment, and we went into, you know, to the big lobby, Mark, that looks like, uh, I don't know, the Pantheon. And right. we, we sat in a chair, Iggy sat in my lap. Now he's so big I could sit in his lap. And there was another chair for Steve. Steve comes out and he sits down and he says, Lowell, you be quiet, this is between Iggy and me. And they had such a good time. And he, he told, you know, he told Iggy stuff and Iggy, um, said, you know, what's it like to throw a spiral? And Steve showed him his very famous left hand. And he said, look, Iggy, I have a small hand. Um, it's smaller than Joe's, Joe Montana. And he said, sometimes I throw an interception, but I'm so happy it was a good spiral. I come off the field feeling pretty good saying, sure, it was an interception, but it was a good pass. <laughs> so, and um, uh, Iggy was wearing a little cap 49ers. And he says, would you like me to sign it? So Iggy was like in heaven. He says, yeah. So Steve signs it and he says, um, would you like Jerry Rice to sign it? So Iggy says, yeah. So Steve says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go get Jerry. I'll get him to sign it. So we were in a public area. He went through a, a door where media is not allowed. So he was gone really a long time, um, 15 minutes. So he comes out and he says, look, I couldn't find Jerry. I couldn't get him to sign it. So I said, oh, that's okay. And we'll go. And he said, no, no, I'm going to get it like this, like the quarterback says, I'm going to get it. I just wanted to let you know, it's going to take a little more time like that. So, okay. So we're waiting. Brent Jones wanders by and he says, what are you doing? We're waiting for Jerry to sign the cap. And he says, well, I'll wait too. Cause can I sign it? He's another one. Brent Jones is wonderful. So finally, Steve comes out. He has to, he has it signed by Jerry. Brent Joe signs it. So he has Iggy really scored. So we're driving home in the car and he says, oh, thanks a lot, dad, uh, you know, for doing all this to me. And I, I said, oh, sweetheart, I love you. Uh, I, I'll do anything for you. And he said, just one other thing. I said, what's that, sweetheart? He said, I wish Steve was my dad. <laughs> 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 and I thought, this is what I get. <laughs> You, you were yeah. feeling so good about yourself, Lowell, as a dad, as yeah. a guy, you gave him this unbelievable thing. Hey, I, wish I, gotta, I have to question Iggy about that at some point. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's great. But, um, you know, Steve Young, uh, was such a gracious guy, and, and he was kind of really thrown into, if you could talk a little bit about this too, Lowell, is a difficult situation because think about it in the history of the National Football League, how many Hall of Fame quarterbacks have been replaced or followed by another Hall of Fame quarterback, but Joe Montana wasn't obviously just a Hall of Fame quarterback. He's purely a legend in the Bay Area, and Steve Young had to come in and uh, basically uh, try and not supplant him, but, but to just try and follow in his footsteps. And that was a really difficult thing because, as you well know, Lo, they're two very, very different, not only players, but two very different men. Uh, Joe is extremely introverted. He's shy. He's introverted. Uh, and Steve is a real extrovert. So um, they were extremely competitive. I don't know what went on behind the scenes between Joe Montana and Steve Young. It always has struck me that Joe does not like Steve very much. I once asked him a few years ago, uh, do you like Steve? And he said, I treat him the way I would treat any other teammate. Well, that's not like saying I love him. Um, I think Steve is probably doesn't have uh, those uh, kinds of feelings uh, about Joe. I can tell you that it was so competitive, and my son who's listening knows this. Bill Walsh was intrigued by Steve. One, he was younger than Joe, and he was a lefty. Bill was a lefty. And what Bill thought was defenses are organized to combat a right-handed thrower. Well, if I have Steve, it changes everything for the defense. And he was intrigued by that. So one day he called the coaches meeting. And I know this because coaches in that meeting have told me. And he said, I'm thinking of trading, uh, getting rid of Joe Montana and making Steve the starting quarterback. 
Everybody who agrees with me, raise your hand. And it was the whole coaching staff. Not one guy raised his hand. <laughs> Not one. So that's what they thought of Joe Montana. Later, when George Seifert became the coach, he did get rid of Joe for Steve. But very few people know that Bill at least put up a trial balloon, but never followed through. <laughs> that's good. That's good stuff. Um, you, you know, just to touch on uh, Joe Montana, uh, because he, you know, Steve's a gregarious guy. You can see him. He's a, he's a pure natural on television doing yes. his uh, ESPN stuff. Uh, Joe had his shot at doing that and it just wasn't right for him. He, he had a chance at a national network show after he uh, retired and, um, you know, your, your interaction with, with Joe Montana, anything more that, that strikes you? Because uh, I think, you know, most people, I mean, Steph Curry is approaching that status. But when you think about the history of Bay Area sports, I mean, most people say, you know, Willie Mays, Joe Montana, you know, kind of neck and neck. And, and now Steph Curry's creeping up there. But a um, little bit more on Joe. You know, um, Joe actually had a good sense of humor. He did not like to talk to Ira Miller and me at the Chronicle. He felt we were uh, critical, and he might have been right, but he did speak to a lot of others. So he was really good in that regard. He, he did, wasn't anti-media. He once said a funny thing. My colleague and my friend at the Chronicle, Glenn Dickey, um, after Niner games, we would all go down to the locker room, you know, to talk to the coach and to get quotes. Glenn was an opinion guy, so he rarely would, rarely would go down. And, you know, it used to bother me sometimes. I would schlep up, and he'd be done. He'd be packing up. He had sent in his article, and I hadn't even started writing. So one day, I guess Glenn went down to the locker room at Candlestick Park, and Joe was giving a post-game thing at his locker. He was talking, and he sees Glenn walk by, and I don't think he had ever seen Glenn in the locker room before, and he stopped his news conference, and he said, Glenn's in the locker room. Did he get lost? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Hey, you know, Lo, we've uh, we've touched on some of the personalities, but I, I want to get into a little more of the philosophical aspect of, of your writing and the writing that you have done as a sports writer and the relationship. And you and I have talked about this before. Uh, if you could talk a little bit about how um, the relationship between athletes and the media, how that has evolved, how it's changed. And basically, it's become contentious. And as I've mentioned before, it, it's an unsolvable problem. But, um, you know, did you feel when you called it quits, uh, it was at the right time? And do you agree with me that it seems to be getting worse and worse? And, and I'll inject a little more of the here and now too, is I don't think after what we've all gone through uh, with the pandemic and the way that the media is forced to cover sports right now, I believe that the athletes themselves, the players, are absolutely going to love this. They don't have to have the media invade, so to speak, uh, their their locker room or their clubhouse after the game. There's no one-on-one -on -one right now. Everything's on a Zoom. You don't get to pick who you want to interview. Uh, also, um, I think the players love the fact that, I mean, not all of them. I'm not going to put a blanket over them. But I was thinking today, seeing opening day last night for the Giants, today with the A's, I bet a lot of these players kind of like not having the interaction uh, with the fans, not being yelled at, screamed at, and not having to sign autographs. Uh, from the time you started your career, Lowell, the involvement of the media athletic relationship and your sure. writing. Um, I started in 1979 as a columnist at the San Francisco Chronicle. And I'll, re I'll just remind you and what it was like. Um, in spring training, after the game was over, and after we had filed our stories or you had done your video or whatever, do you remember that they'd, at the team hotel, they would have a room with snacks, beer, oh, yeah. wine, 
and the coaches would hang around. Frank Robinson yeah. would be there. You'd have a happy hour seven days a week. Yeah. You, you, absolutely, right? And yeah. you got a lot of business done. You talk to people over a beer. You got a lot of business done. I'm, I'm giving baseball as, as an example, but it could be the NFL easily. Um, before real games, you would go into the clubhouse whenever, and you would hang around till about 45 minutes before the game. Would you say, Mark? Sure. Uh, 45, yeah. yeah, 45 Absolutely. minutes. And then after the game, you'd go in again. Now, even before Corona, there were only, you could only get in for about an hour. Uh, and after batting practice, you couldn't go back in. So they were constantly cutting off um, your access to the players. Used to be you could go in the manager's office and sit and talk. Bruce Bochy, I like very much. You could only talk when he opened up his door. You couldn't go in and talk to him. Bob Melvin, who's a friend of mine, you, I once went in his office and he gave me a look like, what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> yeah. Tony Larusa, he used to go and watch television with Tony Larusa. And Melvin's, a, I mean, an easier guy to get along with. Things are tough. And again, the Giants. You know, Mark, they, when they moved to the beautiful new ballpark, they got like in the back, the room we're not allowed to go to. They have a chef and all kind of good food. Well, after the, a day game or even a night game, when you're on um, deadline and you're, you're really plotting because you got to get your stuff in, these guys sit down and eat. And then they come out when they feel like it. Whereas right. in the past, even tough guys, like say Jeffrey Leonard was a tough guy. Will Clark, after a game, they were at their locker doing business. They would answer questions and then they would go get a meal or whatever. It's turned on its head. And as a result, it's made it, at the end, I found it disheartening. I did. I found it disheartening. And I used to get sometimes angry being in a, a post-game uh, clubhouse of the Giants and no players there. Right. And I mean, no players. Buster Posey, he may be a lovely person, but he would come out in his own sweet time. Um, you know, uh, all of them. Pablo Sandoval, oh my goodness. If you're waiting on him, you got to, you, you know... He's a nice guy, but he was like, what do you think we're doing here? It used to dishearten me. And I could say, people say, boy, you get to meet the players. It's so exciting to be a sports writer. <laughs> At the end, meeting the players to the extent that I even could meet them was not the high point of my day. Yeah, I, I agree. It, it's changed so much. And so the obvious question, what changed? Because it, it appears, but is it this simple? that the obvious change has been the enormous, almost mind-boggling amounts of money that they make. Uh, when we started, and I, I also by coincidence started at Channel 2 low in 1979, uh, at that time, the players, you could make an, a case for the fact that they kind of needed us. Uh, they needed us to enunciate how well they were doing over the airwaves or be able to show that they could put a sentence together and look good on camera. Maybe they're going to get a, a shaving commercial in the off season. I, I remember having uh, one of the 49ers tell me that. Yeah, man, anytime you want to interview me, you know, no, no problem. I want to be on camera, you know, and, and look good. And, and maybe somebody will see me and, and give me a car commercial or something. <laughs> and, and now you know, that's, that's laughable because there, you could make a case that there's not one single thing any of the media need from us in their minds, but they don't realize, at least a lot of them don't seem to realize that we help perpetuate their stories and generate the interest that extends to the public and generates you know, the television revenue and, and brings people to the ballpark because of these storylines. But there aren't many, and you can tell me if you agree with this, I don't think there are that many athletes and even coaches and managers that understand the concept of what our job is, you know, and, and how it plays right into them. And then you'll see a guy like uh, Hunter Pence, who seems to totally get it. And, and I've... Um, you know, imagine myself as an athlete, how I would handle the media. And I've always thought my frame of mind would be, I'd have fun with it. Uh, come to me, I'll give you the quote, of, you know, I'll give you your quote of the day and, and make it into a game and, and be able to have some fun. Very few of them, Hunter Pence came to, the, to, to my head as a guy who not only gets it, 
but he seems to enjoy the interaction and and there aren't many like that would you say lol uh, no 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 there aren't i'm trying to think who was remember the reliever for the giants was a brian was wilson what was brian wilson right brian wilson he got it he he was very playful uh very bright uh he got, he got that um yeah and he, he i remember after one game when Tim Lincecum, who's a very nice man, but very shy, was beginning to fail. And he had had a bad game. It was a day game. And of course he was a starting pitcher. You have to talk to the starting pitcher. And he, he had lost. So we were waiting by his locker and waiting and waiting and waiting. And Brian Wilson had the locker next to his. And he came over and he said, what are you guys waiting for Tim? And he was so mature. And we said, yes. And he said, have you been waiting a long time? And we said, well, frankly, we have, yes. He said, no, hold on a minute. He goes into the off-limits room, comes walking out with Tim Lincecum. Tim Lincecum walks to his locker, apologizes, and said, what do you need? And Brian Wilson made that happen. Precipitated uh, it, that, yeah. It was yeah, so facilitated uh, that. Yeah, and, and there are very few guys like that. A guy who pops into my head that totally got it from the get-go and, and has made a great career. But how about Bob Brenly of the Giants? <laughs> Right. Oh, oh, you know, he could go in anyone's top five. Yeah. From from day one. From day uh, one. He understood what the media wanted. And he almost had an eye toward the end of his career that, that he would like to get into that. And he's an excellent communicator on all levels. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, those types are far and few between. But, you know, if they understood the value, even now with them making money, if they could look at the entire picture and understand that their sport largely depends, uh, certainly a huge percentage of it depends on uh, how many people are watching, you know, who's going to the games, who's buying what. And um, unfortunately, a lot of those guys have lost sight of that, I think. I'll tell you who really got it, who was really a character. I think you would agree. Don Nelson. Yeah. yeah definitely. Don Nelson. I mean, he was a character. Uh, some of it was very um, attractive. Some of it not so attractive. And but, calculated. Oh, a hundred. Would you agree? A hundred percent calculated. Yeah. I'm talking to Mark now. What do I want from Mark? Right. Yes. How can I? What can I get from Mark? And he would charm you and all that. But he was an interesting guy. And I, you know, it was worth it. When I could, he was two people, Lowell. He he was Nelly when he wanted to be attractive and yes. manipulative and get what he wanted. And then at other times, if he was mad at you or what have you, he, he was suddenly Don Nelson. No Nelly. Yes. You know, you know right? Mark, I never called him Nelly because no. I didn't want to play into that. I never, no. called, but a lot of people did. Oh yeah. When, when he would be angry at me and I, I would ask a question, he would dismiss me by saying, I don't want to answer that. I have bigger fish to fry. <laughs> Thanks, Don. Yeah, now he would say he's got bigger um, uh, joints to smoke. <laughs> Apparently, right? I, I guess. That's that's what he's doing over in Hawaii from everything I've seen, you know. So, <laughs> but, uh, but so do you see any, um, any way of it getting better? I mean. No. no, listen, I think the, now my son is in a better position when we unmute, he could talk about this. He says that the Niners are actually much more easier, much more easy to cover now that Kyle Shanahan is the coach as opposed to Jim Harbaugh, who, as you know, I like. Um, but under Harbaugh, that was a difficult locker room to work. But I would say in general, I'll give an example. When I used to cover a Bill Walsh team, if I wanted to talk to Randy Cross uh, after a game, I could stand and talk to Randy for half an hour if he was yeah. Uh, now, Easy. if I wanted to talk, let's say, to Joe Staley before he retired, I'd be talking to Joe. I knew Joe. He was nice. Some operative from the PR department would come over and say, Joe's got to go. Joe's yeah. gotta go. And I would think, who invited you, right? So the yeah. league seems to have now a policy to cut you off so they don't have anything to say because they're afraid they're going to get into trouble. They have no confidence in the players that they're going to say something so outrageous it'll look bad for the team. So they try to cut off communication. And I got to tell you, Mark, sometimes I'd be at the height getting my best stuff and some idiot would say, they use, in the Niners they say, 
couple more, it means wrap it up. Yeah. Wrap it up. And I would say, get out of here. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. It, it's pretty amazing how um, it's so controlled. You, like you said, you could, you could, the first time I ever asked Joe Montana to do an interview, he was a rookie just out of Notre Dame. I'll never forget this. Easily approached him as he walked off the practice field, then back at Redwood City. And I said, hey, Joe, do you have a couple of minutes to do an interview? And he looked at me kind of, you know, quizzically, and he goes, why do you want to talk to me? Steve, De, you know, Steve DeBerg's the, the starting quarterback. You know, that's how, how it's changed. And, you know, it, it got more difficult to, to interview a guy like him. But as you say, a, you know, a, a normal guy on that, even those uh, wonderful Super Bowl teams, you could easily walk up to him at any time. I mean, um, people are uh, blown away by, you know, so many things that happened in our world that have um, – you know, facilitated this as like nine one one. Everything changed with security. Yeah, but you could just walk down. You know, I used to watch the Forty Nine er games um, from from the sidelines. You know, with my pass, I'd I'd wander up and down. I was uh, twenty five feet away from Dwight Clark when he made that catch. Just uh, <laughs> you know, in the end zone on the on the other end of it. I I was um, you know right behind home plate. Uh, at Dodger Stadium, um, probably 45 feet away from Kirk Gibson when he hit that famous home run off Dennis Eckersley. I mean, uh, all these things that, um, you know, used to be possible for the media, and they gave you such insight to be closer. And, yes. and, uh, and I think it's going, I think it's going to be extreme, uh, it, it, extremely impacted by what we're seeing now because in so many instances, we're never going back to the the old way it's going to be the new normal and i wouldn't be surprised if they kept uh, media people uh, at, a, at an extremely low low rate uh, ever going into locker rooms and clubhouses again i have um a question for you and then maybe we should throw it open to questions yeah for viewers uh, what did you miss when there was no sports this summer what did you miss about it um being able to get get out of the house. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good answer. <laughs> uh, I think we can all uh, relate a little bit to that. But, uh, you know, I, I think obviously we're living in such a strange time and, and I'm as guilty of this as anyone else. Sometimes sports, it, it's just you know, I've never been an overly competitive person, so I don't get too wound up about that aspect of it. But it is, you know, I admit, kind of a, a nice diversion. And for me, um, baseball was my first love as a kid. And I've almost been lulled into a calm state, almost a meditative state. When I used to hear, for those of you who grew up in the Bay Area and old enough to remember, say, you know, Lon Simmons' voice, you know, in, in my uh, dad's garage doing a baseball game on a summer afternoon, or, you know, my dad would be out uh, mowing the lawn in the backyard and having the radio on. And, and now John Miller's voice kind of, does that to me, you know, where it's just, you know, you're not even really paying attention to every word. And, and I, I really miss that about um, baseball in particular, and just how it's kind of woven into uh, the fabric of, of our society. And then when it's pulled away in, in such fashion, uh, to me, I, I really noticed it and it, it messed with my, my rhythm of life a little bit. And so, you know, we, we all have to be resilient and all of that, but uh, some of us are, are, you know, less so. And, you know, I found myself just kind of uh, missing it maybe on a, a, almost a subconscious uh, level that there's some, something different. Something seems harsher. Something seems to make me want to, like, have to face reality head on day in and day out. Even the sports section i'm old-fashioned i like to go out to my uh, uh you know newspaper guys like you will love to hear this i used to love to go out I, I still do to the driveway and pick up my san francisco chronicle and, and look at the box scores and and all that and and there's certain comfort in that and those things were were all gone the sports section was 
eek as depressing as the business section, as depressing as the obituaries. You know, I mean, you know, and and usually it's a nice a nice escape, if you will. Um, but yeah, it's very noticeable in my life. Not to mention, it made my sports cast extremely boring. Yeah, you know, if I could tap dance, I I would have for the past <laughs> few months. <laughs> Mark, that was a really eloquent answer. Thank you. <laughs> no, but uh, I, I'm game for questions. If yeah, let's you... do it. Yeah. yeah, we actually have three questions in the chat box. So I'm going to ask those if we can start out with that. First one is, to what do you attribute the lack of black baseball players unlike in football and basketball? Boy, that is a really tough question. Um, Mark, I'll say what I have to say. You may, you may have a better insight than I do. First of all, I think it's possible that African American uh, young people are more attracted to basketball and football uh, for whatever reason. I also think that it requires a certain amount of money once you become a really, really good older little league player. It requires money for travel and for uh, motel rooms and things like that. And inner city kids might not have that. So uh, those may be the socioeconomic reasons. Mark, do you have any other ideas? Well, I think it's a great question. And uh, the first thing that comes to my mind is that, and, and hopefully, I mean, as a lover of baseball, I hope this is cyclical uh, and, and baseball becomes quote unquote cool again. But right now, baseball is not that cool. The NBA and football are really cool and attractive to, to young people. And, and I think they gravitate towards that. And um, I can see a future where the NFL starts losing its popularity because of the health hazards involved. And when a lot of people start realizing, wait a second, uh, there's less chance of injury and um, Look at uh, Mookie Betts is making you know, almost half a billion dollars. You know, those kinds of things have to be attractive in the future. But um, I think it's difficult to put together a baseball game now in a neighborhood. We're all kind of splintered. You know, Lowell, I know you share the same experience as I did. Um, growing up, I grew up in, in San Rafael, and Lowell obviously grew up, you know, 3,000 miles away. But we would wander down to the playground and put together a, a baseball game. You got, you, you know, you got 10 or 11 guys. Hey, we got, you know, we'll take five on a team and right field's closed. Yeah, or, right. You, you, you know, or, or that kind of thing. Or the backstop is, you know, there's no catcher, you know. And, and you made sure that you were playing baseball every day all summer long. I don't see kids um, gathering anymore. Uh, you know, in the parks to, to put together a baseball game like like there used to be. Um, you know, it's much easier to to get a hoop, and uh, and and there are so many more distractions now. You know, with with the you know they're all here, they're all looking at their phones. You know, and um, that's a simplistic view, but it certainly enters into the picture. I think uh, I think it's unfortunate, and I do want to say one thing. And Lowell, I know you you know this guy. I thought Gary Radnich, a former contemporary of mine on Channel Four, um, someone told me about a tweet he did today, which I thought captured a lot for me. Um, he said it's really great that all the Giants wore their warm-up shirts that said Black Lives Matter and the manager kneeled and most of the players and coaches kneeled and all that. But hey guys, it would speak a little louder if you had more than one black player on your entire roster. So, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I thought, you know, um, Gary Radnich, he doesn't tweet very much or do any of that, but I thought that was a, a really, uh, almost profound statement like do all your stuff but how about put your money where your mouth is and start developing some black players and uh make it happen that way which is you know you, you think about the giants i was that uh tweet made me think when i grew up what do you think of when you think of the san francisco giants i used to think you know willie mays uh willie mccovey jimmy ray hart uh you know gary maddox gary matthews you know, on to Bobby Bonds, Dusty Baker. I mean, so many great black players. 
and, and it's almost inconceivable that the San Francisco Giants only have one black player who is not even in their major plans. It doesn't seem to be. It seems to be a, you know, kind of a um, outskirts player. So, you know, that's, that's the problem. And I know there's been a lot of inroads. People are trying to make the game happen in the inner city, but uh, I don't know what kind of progress they're making. Right. But it's really a shame because the 60s and 70s were the most dynamic time uh, you know, when you think about the Maury Wills, Lou Brock, Hank Aaron, you know, Mays, it goes, it goes Great, on thanks. and on and on. Yeah. yeah. So. Thank you so much. Uh, second question in the chat box is referring back to the conversation about um, players who are nice to talk to versus players who are not nice to talk to. And it's a question about hockey players. Where do they fall on that spectrum? Well, uh, Lowell, I'll, uh, you go ahead, but I have real strong, uh, real strong opinion about that. Go ahead. Okay, um, it's a, it's actually a paradox because you think of hockey players as really violent people. I mean, they hit each other hard and they get into fights all the time. My experience, Mark, with hockey professional hockey players, they are the most polite, the most cordial. Uh, I mean, you're talking to them after the game; they have no teeth. Right? <laughs> they look really weird, but they're, they're I, I would say, really a gift from God. Have you experienced that? Oh, Lowell, I, first of all, let me preface my comments about that. I was born in Canada, okay? So I'm, I'm hockey friendly to say the least. But um, I do this thing where I've, I've posed this question to many people, and I, I may even have done it to you, uh, to, um, you know, uh, fellow uh, people in the media business. Give me your top five from best athletes in the different sports, you know, difficult to, to um, deal with, you know. And um, so hockey players, definitely the nicest. Second nicest, football players. Third nicest, basketball players. Fourth nicest, golfers lowest and most difficult baseball players and hockey players this is a generality but i can say this from because i'm from canada they're they're farm boys from winnipeg you know out in the fields and they're just happy to to be making a ton of money playing the game they love and, and i so much agree with you they're they're so polite and which is a, an interesting uh, contrast being that their game is, is so violent. And I attribute football players to being so nice that even though they, they, um, you know, they play a violent game as well, but they've also gone to college. And even if they haven't graduated, they've matriculated to an extent where they've been socialized and they know how to give and take, and they've been exposed to different ideas and cultures and those kinds of things, which always translate to, to relationships with with people would you would you put football number two guys or what, yes what uh, i would i and I, I would add um there are gradations in football um uh, depending on the position some are friendlier yeah. than others for example and our viewers may not know this but this is known the people you like the best on a football team are the offensive linemen they are the yeah. most normal people they're normal I don't know why it is. They're these big guys. I think I do understand. They're there to protect the quarterback. They're like in chess, they protect the king and like the pawns or whatever. And so they think of themselves as a unit, not as individual stars, like maybe an edge rusher on the defense. Would Absolutely. Think of and that's they a are great, great quote. And, you know, that reminds me of a story. Joe, Joe Montana his offensive lineman loved him because Joe Montana, he said he's shy and he's, but he's also a jeans and t-shirt guy. That's how I describe him. And Joe, uh, you probably know this too, Lowell. Remember Keith Fonhorst and, and Randy Cross and I'm, I'm spacing on the, the other names of the offensive Johnny. lineman who protected Joe in his heyday almost to a man. I remember Keith Fonhorst, six foot seven, 300 pound guy, huge Viking of a guy. He used to call him Joey. We want to make sure Joey doesn't get hit, you know? And, and that always stuck with me. It was like, they're the big brothers 
and don't mess with our little brother back there who's throwing the passes. And you're, you're, I haven't really put it in those terms, well, but you're right. I probably have like more offensive linemen throughout, throughout my oh, days. I, and they're also, again, I don't know why, they're also highly intelligent and verbal and articulate. So if yeah. you want someone to describe what happened and can get actually thematic and philosophical, you go to the left to the left tackle. Joyce <laughs> Kelly was that way. Yeah. Think about guys. it. Yeah. Harris Barton, Joe yeah. Staley, down yeah. down through the years. Uh, your your left tackle, the guy in the the, the toughest pressure position to yeah. protect the back of most right handed quarterbacks, you know, uh you know, very, very good uh, observation role. <laughs> Thank you for answering that question. I've got another one here. Uh, good reporting print and TV radio was part of growing up in the Bay Area, but now it's Twitter feeds from players and press. How has social media changed reporting? It's kind of a big question there for you. Well, I have a big, Mark, may I go first on this one? Yeah, yeah, you, because Lowell, I don't tweet. I don't Facebook, I don't do any of it, never will, but you are young at heart, Lowell, and you take that, that social media question and run. Okay, I feel, let, let's just talk about Twitter, okay? Because it's the one I'm most familiar with. I, I don't do Facebook either. I feel that Twitter has ruined sports writing, and that's not hyperbole. I'm not exaggerating, and I want to, I can be very quick on this one. When I came up, um, my attitude was I wanted to be true to myself and true to the truth. I wanted to speak the truth and especially speak truth to power, i.e. owners, rich owners, uh, who sometimes were, were not the best people. Um, I didn't care if a team liked me or if an owner liked me or if players liked me, as long as I was true to truth and true to myself. I didn't care if fans liked me because I knew they'd read me. They didn't read me because they liked me. They read me, be they read me because they wanted to be stimulated and provoked or even made angry. Now, I'm gonna speak about newspapers because it's what I understand. They're in a lot of trouble newspapers. And one of the way they judge their writers, do you get a lot of tweets? Do you have a lot of Twitter followers? Yeah. They do. And if you have a lot of Twitter followers, it means Maybe you'll get a little raise, or maybe they won't lay you off on the next round of layoffs. So sports writers for newspapers are desperate to get a lot of Twitter followers, and that makes a sea change. It means that they have to please fans. They have to, yes. in fact, compromise their commitment to truth and their commitment to themselves to get a commitment to Twitter followers. So they speak the company line, whatever. The team may have lost 10 games in a row, but they're doing great and they show promise. You know what I mean? It's so to me, uh, I want to use a curse word here, but I got to be good. To me, it's a lot of hooey. I, I, I read uh, sports pages now and I think, how the hell did you write that? Uh, did you even yeah. believe what you wrote? So I'm, I'm getting worked up. Mark, you better jump in. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And um, so many sports writers have put themselves, think about this, because I've had emails from viewers saying, why did you say this or whatever. Think about how many writers that you, I don't know if any of our Zoomies have uh, uh, you know, a propensity to listen to sports talk radio, but how often do you hear newspaper writers on the radio? Well, the regulars get paid for that. And, you know, you talk about your play-by-play -play guys, like, say, for instance, a Greg Papa. He's on KNBR Radio, the giant station, and he's also the 49ers play-by-play -play guy. Very talented guy. But do you think he doesn't know where his bread is buttered? How critical do you think he's going to be? Take it to a different level. Take the guy who covers the Giants, Henry Schulman who is a really nice guy, but uh, he also gets paid by KNBR Radio to be a regular contributor to their content. And that 
takes the edge off him. He's not going to do anything to irritate the Giants too much. He'll tell a little bit of truth, but it's all watered down. Uh, Bob Fitzgerald, who used to have a, a talk show on KNBR, he's the Warriors play-by-play -play guy. How much truth is he going to give you about the Warriors on his three-hour talk show? Think about those things as sophisticated viewers and listeners and, and all those things to open your eye how to Lowell's point of how journalism has changed and watered down. Let me tell you a quick why I don't tweet. <laughs> it's the true story. Uh, we had a new boss come in as the news director at Channel 2, and he said, I want all the on-air people. You know, I'm going to start keeping track of, you know, how often you tweet during the day. I want you all to have Facebook posts uh, every day and blah, blah, blah. And so I held out until he you know, specifically said, Mark, you're the only on-air person that doesn't have a Twitter account. They finally taught me how to do it, blah, blah, blah. Swear on my kids, this is the truth. I finally learned how to do it. I said, I'm going to do my first tweeting. Uh, uh, we were doing the post-game show for the Raiders. And um, so I'm watching the game. I send out the most innocuous tweet. All I said was, Derek Carr looks pretty good so far in the first quarter. I was just dipping my little toe into Twitter world, you know, to do my first tweet. This is what I received in response. My first response on Twitter, Mark, nobody cares what you think. Everybody <laughs> hates your guts. <laughs> so, that was it. Done. And I put it in my last contract. I don't tweet. I don't Twitter. I don't Twitter paint, I don't Facebook, <laughs> never. I don't care, and I don't care what the next guy had for breakfast. And, you know, I don't care, you know, and I'm not going to give in. So that's it. Everybody hates your guts. <laughs> my, I'm a TV guy. My ego can't take it. <laughs> that's a wonderful story. It's true. That was the end of it to the extent where I actually put it in my contract. No one can make me tweet. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can all respect that, honestly. <laughs> um, so there's a bit of a follow-up question to that. Um, the Bay Area has been blessed with extra special sports announcers from Simmons Hodges, Bill King, to current baseball announcers, especially great chemistry with Giants TV radio. And I so appreciate Amy G. Do you think that will continue or will radio games fade? Mark, that's your area. Well, I was disturbed in a big way because I just lamented a little bit about how much radio played into my childhood and baseball and football and basketball for that matter. We had, you know, we can't talk about Bay Area broadcasters without mentioning the great Bill King. Um, and it played such a big part in my uh, growing love and knowledge of sports. And I was disturbed this year when the Oakland A's and their president, Dave Cavill, proudly announced that the Oakland A's would not have a radio station this year. You can't turn on a, a baseball game and listen to the Oakland A's on the radio. Everything's going to be streamed. And so one of the writers, and I, I think it was Bruce Jenkins, your former colleague at the Chronicle Lowell, wrote about that. And Dave Cavill, the president of the A's response was, eh, he's a boomer, who cares? Oh. You know, oh, a he's, a, he's a baby boomer. Yeah. And if you don't understand how an important intrinsic role that radio, let alone television plays, in what is the romance we, we have had with baseball and all sports, really. Um, it, it's really sad uh, if you don't get that. And, and I think that would be a great part of Americana that we would all be losing and missing out on um, if, if, say, for instance, radio uh, dwindled into you know, a very low profile uh, media outlet. I think it would be a, a shame. Do you think that might happen? Well, I mean, look at the attitude. I mean, here we are in 2020, and the president of the Oakland A's doesn't think that organization that can't get anybody out to the ball game, you know, very low numbers, and they're 
obviously, uh, if you look at the attendance and the ratings, there's playing second fiddle um, to the Giants in a big way in the Bay Area. You put me as president of, of the, uh, you know, the Oakland A's. One of the first things I'm going to do is give fans more opportunity to see and hear my product. Even, you know, even if I'm, I view myself as, you know, above radio and more sophisticated and technologically advanced, stream it, put it on radio, put it on TV, put it on walkie talkie. I mean, get my product out there. You know, that's, it seems like a no brainer. And I, I, I mean, it's pretty disturbing when a, when a major, we're a major market, obviously here in the Bay area. And when a major market, major league team decides they don't think it's worth having a radio station. I, to me, that's disturbing. I would add that uh, their radio guys, Vinny Catronio and Ken Korak are terrific. They're top, really good. Top, top uh, very nice men. Vinny really understands uh, strategies. Very good at yeah. that. Ken Korak paints beautiful, beautiful word pictures. I can yeah. really see. I can really see the game. And Ken Korak has one of the all-time beautiful voices. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. Yeah. One of the nicest guys. Yeah. And um, they need to get their product out there and and uh, fight to get on equal footing. Uh, with the Giants in, in this market and and to waste, as you mentioned, the, the talents in their broadcast booth is, is a crying shame. I mean, you could learn so much just listening to Ken Korak in particular. Big fan of his. You know, by the way, uh, last year, Ken Korak did a book with Susan Slusser about the A's. It's mm -hmm. really a nice book if, if you're looking for... I would want you to buy my book first, but if you're looking for another book, Susan Slusser and Ken Cor <laughs> Make sure I'm not holding it upside down. No, it's wonderful. <laughs> yes. I realized I forgot to turn the light on in my office here. Can you see me? Yeah, you're I mean, looking like you're hosting one of those Saturday yes. Night Horror shows. You, you look a bit like God right now. I would okay. say it's fine. All right. Uh, <laughs> Embrace it. I forgot it. to turn on the light. Okay. <laughs> Me, I'm embracing my TV lighting here. <laughs> I see Bob so, Marley over your left shoulder. <laughs> yep. This, you're in my, this is my vinyl room. All my, my mom uh, saved all my records um, from the 60s and 70s and 80s. And um, she told me, come and get them. They're in the attic. So I had them mounted up here. Beautiful. So we have probably time. Yes, more than welcome. We have time, a little bit of time left. I know Mark has to get back onto TV at some point, but please feel free to unmute yourself. If you want to ask a question yourself, go for it. Anybody wants to? I think I saw a hand or so. I'm all ears. Nobody is wants Grant, to? Is Grant still there? Barbara, go ahead. You can unmute yourself and ask. I okay. think she's trying to unmute herself. <laughs> she's got Unmuted. it. We're good. Is that a, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. It's it's not so much a question as a a heartfelt thank you for this evening. And I have started the book, only read the first chapter to working my way through. But I appreciate both of you for your time um, so much. Of course. Uh, thank you. Well, thank you, Barbara. And, 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 I'm, and I'm one of the boomers who, <laughs> who would be listening to the A's opening game tonight. Yes. I can't. Absolutely. I'm, I'm right with you. We're, we got to watch it on TV. And thanks. It, you know, I meant what I said. I mean, the, the thing that, that I loved about Lowell and you will love about this book is it's uncompromising. He's the antithesis of the, the writers of today that have kind of put themselves in a precarious position of being beholding to the teams they cover, you know, and their own employment with the newspaper. Uh, Lowell was less afraid of those consequences and cared less about it than, than anybody I know. And you got the most honest writing that you could ever ask for because um, somehow he was able to rise above all that and, and give you, you know, you may disagree with him vehemently, but as I'm sure you've been able to glean, he's not the dumbest guy on the planet. And so there's probably a lot of, uh, 
you know, uh, a lot of truth in what he's writing and, and did write. So I think you'll enjoy the book. I have something to add about that. And you'll, when I say it, you'll know it's right. I had conflict with a lot of sports figures. Out and out conflict, not hitting, but arguing, yelling, conflict. And when you do that, it often leads to deeper relationships. You work it out and then you get to know it's a form of bonding. And I had conflict with Jim Harbaugh, with uh, Mariucci, uh, with, with Frank Robinson, Don Nelson, Will Clark. These are guys I get along very well with. It brings you sometimes to, sometimes it doesn't, but it's worth the risk. No question about it. By the way, I do want to mention, um, you know, the other two on my top five. Um, Ronnie Lott, definitely in my top five. Love the guy. And, uh, and obviously, Willie, Willie Mays is responsible uh, for getting me into sports. He's meant so much to me in, in my life on, on so many levels. And, um, you know, Ronnie Lott, Dusty Baker, Al Adels, and uh, Dwight Clark. And, uh, you know, that, that pretty much does it for me as far as, you know, the, the time allotment that we have. But I, I could talk about all those guys for, for an hour and the impact that they've, um, they've made in, in my life. And uh, like Lowell, I'm sure we, we both feel like pretty darn lucky to have been in our professions during this era. And, and I don't think it's hyperbole to say a real true golden era of Bay Area sports. I mean, five 49ers Super Bowls, uh, seven appearances, the A's World Series, you know, Giants, Warriors, what they're doing these days. I mean, it's it's been a, a pretty amazing run. Hey, Dad, you got a Dusty Baker story? The reason I ask is uh, when I was 21, you took me to spring, spring training, and I was doing like a trainer interview where I was asking Dusty Baker questions about music. And you set me up with the questions, and I, you walked away, and as we got started, he like whispered to me, he said, you know, Grant, your dad's not afraid of anything, and I've seen it. And that's what he said to me. It was, <laughs> a, I was like, cool. Yeah, so tell me. I'm, I'm sure both of you guys have a Dusty Baker story, but I'd love to hear a good one. Well, uh, I'm sure, Mark. First of all, can I ask you a question? Do you still want Steve to be your dad? <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, no. Can I be it was, your dad? It took me years. It took me years. <laughs> you got I'm over that. By you now. Okay. You're a great dad. I'm sure he's yeah. pretty good, though, too. So here was a, here's a Dusty Baker story. It's in the book. Uh, you know, when you write columns, you're always thinking of ideas and unusual things to do. So I thought, what if I get the signatures, how they write their name of very famous sports people? And you could get them off their baseball cards. Uh, certain baseball cards have their signature. So I got uh, maybe 10 baseball cards. I was at the Chronicle and I went to a graphologist, someone who analyzes handwriting. And I had this very nice man analyze handwriting of very famous sports figures. And then the Chronicle ran it um, with, the, with the signature and then a paragraph or so of what the graphologist said. Well, the graphologist said, as I recall, that Dusty pressed very hard when he wrote Dusty Baker. And he said, among other things, it indicated a very strong sexual drive. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So, <laughs> so you know, the, uh, the, it came out, the article came out, and I never thought about it again. Then uh, a few days later, the Giants, uh, he was a coach at the Giants, and they were down in LA <laughs> playing the Dodgers. And before the game, I was in the clubhouse, and Dusty comes out of the clubhouse, and he, he says, hey, look, come over here. Um, come in the coach's room. I got a question to ask you. And I was thinking, like, what would he have? I said, what? He goes, he, go, he goes, we're cool, right? I'll never forget it. I said, of course we're cool. I, I said, why would you even say that? He goes, well, you know that, that article you wrote. I said, which one? He goes, about my handwriting. I said, well, yeah. I said, first of all, it wasn't me. It was the handwriting specialist. He said, yeah, but you wrote that I have a very strong sex drive. And I said, well, yeah, that's what the guy said. He said, well, my wife didn't like it. <laughs> and I said, well, why? And he said, she thinks you're saying that I'm messing around on the road. And I said, uh, oh, 
God. Oh God. I, I never thought that would happen. And I said, um, Oh look, I'll write, I'll write her a letter and I'll tell her I had no intention of writing that. Plus I don't know what you do on the road. I'm not with you. And, and, it, and he goes, no, no, we're cool. We're cool. We're cool. But yes, I would have to say that was a very interesting Dusty Baker interaction. Good way to end it, Lowell. <laughs> Cheryl, uh, Cheryl, I think you had a question. Do you want to ask yeah. the last question tonight? Oh, sure. Am I? Can you hear me now? Yes, we yeah. can. Go for well, it. I just wanted to tell Lowell. I'm sure he's got so many um, people that love him that it's you know uh, that it's probably something he hears a lot. But I just started reading your art, your uh, column in the uh, must have been about the time you started in the Chronicle, and I have never put down a sports page since then. You really, you really, really got me to read sports pages, your column particularly. And I was really sad myself when you retired from the Press Democrat three, whatever it was, three years About three ago. Years. So yes, you, you've been a bright spot in my uh, daily newspaper reading and made me really, I've learned a lot about sports and uh, from you. And so I just want to thank you for what you've given me all these years. Oh, that's great. Okay. What a nice thing to say. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Well, I think that is just the perfect way to end things. I want to thank uh, the Napa Public Library, which we are partnered with on this event. We are always happy to partner with them, Napa Book Mine and the Napa Library. It's a wonderful partnership that we have. I want to thank Mark Ibanez for joining us and for giving so much of his time in order to be here. And of course, My pleasure. Thank you to Lowell Cohen for joining us, for writing the book Gloves Off, which we do have in stock. If you haven't purchased it yet, I highly recommend it. And we hope that we see you all soon again on another virtual event and that everyone has a wonderful Friday evening. Thank, Thank you, so you for much. doing this. Thank you for putting this on. I'll You're see you on welcome. the 10 o'clock news in a little while. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much.